thank you for having me. It's uh, it's late here in, in Europe, but it's it's very nice opportunity um, to be given uh, this platform to discuss some of the laboratory research I've been leading and, and directing here um, um, with respect to the different projects. I'll be talking about typical triaxial experiments today, um, and we'll be looking at failure and progressive failure in, in a granitic rock sample. Um, so again, thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, I'll just give a brief outline. Um, we talk about why we're doing these experiments. Um, there's, there's reasons behind this research. I have a background on what's called acoustic emissions, um, and we'll be talking about how they're used in a triaxial setting. I talk about the experimental facilities. For those of you aren't, that aren't familiar with um, experimental rock mechanics, do not worry. I'll give an overview of the operations that we do. Um, we employ two types of measurement systems. Um, oh, sorry. We, we have calibrated acoustic emission sensors. And um, the most novel thing that we're doing here that actually we haven't seen in, in rock samples anywhere else in the world is this distributed fiber optic strain sensing. So we're wrapping our samples with fiber optics to better constrain the strain field on the periphery of the sample. And we're able to detect uh, novel findings right now um, that, are, that are bridging our understanding, uh, even at the laboratory scale, um, of how the rock deforms before failure. I'll give a brief overview of the experimental methodology, and then I'll give a um, variety of results, some of which that are uh, in, in the process of going through right now, and some of them are, are novel, so I, I appreciate any feedback you'd like to give me as well. Um, and then I'll give a brief outlook. So why are we um, looking at seismicity and why do we want to understand seismicity? Well, it's a, it's a detriment and hazard to society. Um, I show uh, my, um, I was at Berkeley before um, doing my PhD. So this is the Bay Area with all the faulting systems from uh, Ross Stein's paper in 1999. And we see that the earthquakes happen on faults in, in, inside this complex media. They're driven by tectonic loads. I have this small schematic here and uh, we have the pre-seismic, co-seismic, and post-seismic phase, along with a variety of different physical behaviors that have been observed or, or, or have been thought to have, to have effects on these um, different phases of the earthquake cycle. So what we're trying to do is, is in the laboratory, better understand these or better develop constitutive, constitutive models to understand exactly what's going on in these situations. Um, in natural seismicity is one, one case that we want to understand, but also, um, sorry, okay, here, sorry. Okay, so induced seismicity is, is something that I'm very interested in because Switzerland's interested in that, and that's why they hired me. Um, they'd like to perform more, um, essentially, geothermal energy exploitation, but there are other um, activities um, to extract geoenergy resources that cause induced seismicity. Um, these are due to the alteration of the underground stress field. Um, why is this problem so hard? Well, I point back to uh, Yehuda Ben Zion's overview paper in 2008. There's a range of time scales um, where you go down to nanoseconds on, on this edge to the age of the Earth on, on the right hand log scale time here. And I've highlighted some different um, physical phenomena that Yehuda was pointing out that span from 0.1 seconds to 200 years or earthquake rupture propagation um, physics may occur over the span of milliseconds to 500 seconds. So the time scales are very difficult for us to constrain. So the scales are difficult. Um, and moreover, length scales come into play where we where he, he highlighted here the size of an atom um, to the circumference of the earth. And again, there's different physical um, relationships or physical processes that are occurring on these different length scales here. Um, so this is one of the reasons why the problem is so complex. But what we try to do as um, scientists and engineers is develop better physical models or physical understanding to help us essentially forecast earthquakes in some regards. Um, prediction is the word that you shouldn't say, but the goal is to get to a predictive model. Um, but we are only at the forecasting um, phase at this moment. One of the things that we look at, um, and this is a highly popularized um, theory of Coulomb stress um, and how changes in, in earthquakes can apply stresses to neighboring fault systems and cause triggering of those fault systems. And we highlight this paper here um, by Jeffrey King in 1994, where you have a fault that dislocates and this can cause um, Coulomb stress transfer to the neighboring faults 
Um, and this can cause essentially different types of triggering processes due to the to, due to the main earthquake. Um, but there's always the question is, are we missing important physics? This is one set of physics that explains this as dislocation theory. Um, but can we build better models uh, using continuum mechanics and even that incorporate statistical physics? Um, this is one of the projects that I was interested in and I was actually employed on. This is the RISE project here in Europe where they were trying to build a more resilient society that encompasses uh, our understanding of earthquake processes from the earthquake itself. You see there's various um, um, activities, including earthquake early warning and seconds to, uh, seconds from the earthquake's nucleation um, to also rapid impact assessment of, and hazard due to building um, uh, degradation. Um, there's a, a lot of different um, activities that can go in and benefit from improved physical models. Um, one of them uh, that have, is of most interest to me is operational earthquake forecasting um, for the future. So if you're interested in this project that's actually wrapping up right now, um, there's the homepage written here. But uh, another thing that we're trying to do in Switzerland is actually um, we're trying to understand this in terms of geoenergy activities. Um, because the resources are quite valuable and the energy is of high demand for all societies, um, it's ubiquitous in that sense. Um, in Switzerland, um, we're very interested again in this geothermal, um, but there's one problematic uh, uh, occurrence that happens when we try to extract this, this energy. There's unpredictable uh, induced seismic, seismic earthquakes that, that occur. Um, and the, the general schematic is that you add anthropogenic for, uh, forcings to the system um, and such as pore fluid injection or high pressurized pore fluids that can destabilize a critically stressed fault that's experiencing some level of normal and shear stress to the to the fault. And by by probing it or pushing it past its limits, this can rupture and run away and then cause a larger event. Um, and this is this for, for Switzerland poses uh, a risk in the sense that it detracts from public acceptance. So there's two main projects here in Switzerland that were attempted. Um, in 2006 and 2013, there were relatively large earthquakes for this region of the world, um, um, and it, it detracted from public acceptance. So both these projects were abandoned, uh, and they're getting back to it now due to uh, socioeconomic forcings um, that are that are geopolitical. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. But these were um, these were stopped due to the induced seismic event. Many of you are aware of Pohong, which was the largest um, geothermal induced seismic event of magnitude 5.5. And then in a, a follow-up paper in 2019 by Zastro, this was referred to as an experimental geothermal power plant. And if we're trying to convince the public and have them accept these types of activities and these types of um, energy, uh, extracting these types of energy resources, we probably shouldn't re refer to them as experimental because it, it's not going to fly with these um, with the constituents. So how do we do this? We try to downscale and improve our understanding. And, and a, there's a range of large scale or medium scale underground rock laboratories around the world, including in the US Forge and also the EGS CoLab, um, but also in France, Bedretto, uh, Sweden, and, and another one in Switzerland here. So I'm part of the Bedretto team. I'll go into that in more detail. But the goal of these projects are essentially to highly uh, to instrument the rock mass that you're doing these uh, engineering activities and, and uh, injection of water into um, to study the physical understanding, whether it be the uh, hydraulic reactivation of, of a shear zone um, due to fluid pressurization and study the induced seismicity, um, or it's, it's to end up with better large scale understanding with what we aim for the future is to get um, an upscalable model or a better understanding of the empirical physics that we can see. Um, and, and how we do this is, is not clear, but this is the types of projects we're doing to better understand what we do for the future. Um, here, I'll just talk quickly and explain what one of these projects do, because what we're doing is we're actually downscaling from one of these projects, um, which is the GTS Grimsel um, test site, um, into the lab. And this Grimsel has many different experiments, one of them being the in situ circula circulation experiment. Um, and what you're looking at here is um, the hydro hydromechanical response of a rock mass. So we're looking at a map view of a, of a rock mass with two 
types of shear faults that pass through S3 here and S1. Uh, and what they were able to do was drill boreholes through these, um, these faults, and they're able to isolate the faults with what's called a packer system. Uh, the packer system allows you to inject fluids onto the structures, and, and then a, a high density array of sensors were deployed. Essentially dynamic sensors, which we'll come to in the lab, our acoustic emission sensors and accelerometers allow us to measure the, um, the what's called pico seismicity um, that's emitted from the um, reactivation of these shear zones by fluid injection. The next step is to not just listen to the seismicity because what we're finding is there's a lot more deformation um, in the rock mass that's not producing seismicity. And if we wanna build better models, we should be aware that our models should be producing deformation patterns that are consistent with the, um, the, the, these rock lab observations. And they also implemented what I call quasi-static sensors. Um, these could be from pore pressure sensors that measure some increase in pore fluid pressure away from the injection well um, to distributing, distributed strain sensing, which I'll talk about in more detail later. And what they, if we isolate this eight, the S3.1 shear zone and represent it as they did here in this study, um, in this PhD, sorry, um, as this one fault, you have these um, compressional and extensional lobes from the shear reactivation of this, of this, of this region from fluid injection. Um, but we were able to capture this with the measurement systems and not just the seismicity as we re-injected or as we re injected into these zones. Um, another thing that we could see was the pore fluid distribution um, from a range and array of pore fluid sensors in the in the near and far field. And we're able to track what's called pore elastic um, uh, stresses that were that also induced seismicity in this case. So there's a there's a complex deformation pattern uh, in both seismicity, um, hydraulically and mechanically in the system that we need to understand if we want to move forward on this topic. Seismicity itself is quite um, interesting. It seems to follow the self-similar scaling first proposed by Aki in the uh, in the late seventies. Um, and what we also see here is a nice representation of different scales of where earthquakes are measured. And I, I'm talking about seismicity at various scales and acoustic emissions are essentially referred to as um, micro or very small earthquakes that are occurring at small length scales on the orders of millimeters to meters in length. Um, and then you get up to larger magnitude fours to zeros. And here we have this view of a larger scale earthquake that can be measured by seismometers distributed on the surface um, and that, that it can relocate and, and, and study the, the hypocenter and the, uh, where the hypocenter occurred and, and the different properties of the earthquake. We also have the same types of sensors um, just at different, that measure at different frequencies that measure essentially the EGS um, micro seismicity induced um, in the Basel operation. And we also, I show again the Grimsel results here where we were re reactivating structures and on those structures we saw seismicity. Um, I leave this portion open because we'll be talking today about um, triaxial laboratory experiments where we implement acoustic emission sensors, which are these, these sensors you see protruding here with the white cables coming off. I'll go into more detail of those um, but this is the gist of what we'll be studying today. But seismicity appears to show some nice scaling. Other features are more difficult, and we'll get we'll come to that. But I just want you to keep this in mind as what we'll be talking about today at this scale. So moving back in time and, and looking at triaxial experiments in the laboratory, these have been absolutely instrumental for us in understanding the constitutive behavior of rock samples in the brittle regime. These experiments have been performed since Mogi and Brace and Byerly, where they look at the stress versus strain response of rock samples. Um, and they allow us to understand in this case, how the sample is shortening to how um, dilation occurs in the sample. I, I don't, uh, I'll, you'll be able to see this in more definition with our experiments, but this is some seminal research that really helped us understand um, what the how rocks behave when fractures are forming in them, or in this case, when there's a frictional fault, a pre-existing frictional fault that unlocks and produces, uh, for example, stick slip events. So this was the traditional experiment. Uh, what Chris Schultz did in the 60s was he attached one of those acoustic emission sensors. So the sensor itself is a crystal that when squeezed produces electricity. Uh, and this relatively primitive, but very advanced at the time technique, you could look 
at the vibrations that were produced from these seismic waves in the rock and count essentially the number of cracks that were occurring. He placed one sensor on and what he saw very, um, very nicely was as he increased the load in the sample and a brittle fracture was, with, this is the brittle fracture that comes down, um, you actually saw this increase in seismicity rate, frequency rate um, that, was, uh, that was incurred leading up to failure. So this is gonna be one of these things that we discuss more that the, the amount of seismicity would grow as the sample was leading up to failure. Um, and, and we have some intuition of why that happens from the lab. And we always try to extrapolate or understand what's happening in the field. So he used one sensor and saw this interesting behavior. He also looked at the statistics and, and found that they followed um, what's called the Gutenberg-Richter law. Many of you will be familiar with this. It's the ratio of large to small earthquakes that followed this scaling behavior here. So he found it to be related to the percent of the overall stress level or the fracture, uh, the percentage of how high the sample was stressed with respect to its failure stress. So there was some nice observations that we're seeing here. And what we attempt to do in this study that I'm showing you today is elaborate on this relationship as one point. Um, if you attach more sensors to the sample, um, Dave Lochner did this and was able to actually locate individual events from their first arrivals using traditional seismological um, tools. Um, and you can see at these different points of the stress strain curve, I uh, show D, E, and F here. You can see D, E, and F. You see this breakout of, of seismicity within the sample that was the the genesis of a, a nucleation of a large fracture. Uh, and this was slowed down in his experiment um, to really recover the, the, the relationship or, or recover the, the track of how this fracture generated was generated inside the sample as it was loaded past its critical stress. The other thing that we can do in the laboratories is study these if you use the right sensors, which we did in a, a separate study. With calibrated sensors, we can apply um, very popularized models such as these omega squared models. Um, this is Brun and Madriaga um, and others. Uh, and we can apply them to the, and, and infer source physics from them and, uh, and place them uh, in comparison to what we're looking at in the field. Because the sensors are calibrated, we're allowed to do this because we're not comparing just voltages here. We have calibrated corrected sensors. Um, therefore, we're able to understand essentially the moment magnitude uh, and, and the source radius, let's say, as it scales with respect to what we're seeing in, in larger scale um, um, natural seismic cases or induced seismic cases. So I plot here the Grimsel um, in situ seismicity, which was found to be within this regime, and other laboratory studies are, are over here. So we see, see this first order scaling that's very interesting to us and, and something that we, we're trying to build on right now. So the experimental facilities, if we now go to the experiments that we were doing, was performed in the lab quake triaxial apparatus. I'll explain this in a second, but essentially it's this large blue frame. Um, inside the frame, we put a, a cell. Uh, the cell allows us to pressurize the rock sample. Um, and then also with the reaction frame, we can push, so we can pressurize, flu pressurize fluids in here and push down in the axial direction. Um, this can simulate the rock being underground. So as you go deeper underground, the confining pressure um, or the lithostatic stresses go up, which we can simulate um, in, this, uh, in, this, in this cell here. Um, we can also then, once at the right depth, essentially, we can add axial loads, which will essentially crack the rock. The, the test facilities here can confine the samples to 170. MPA, which is the equivalent around seven kilometers, um, six to seven kilometers depth and simulate temp temperatures up to 170 degrees. We can also introduce pore fluids. None of these, uh, we were only using the mechanical stresses in this case to generate failure in the sample. So temperature and pore fluids will come next. The, the sample itself is an intact rock sample. You can see there's different types of samples. Um, we can test wet or dry conditions. We're testing a dry sample in, in its intact state, um, but there are different configurations. Um, we're also interested in friction and how unlocking of a very strong discontinuity occurs um, inside highly stressed environments. 
um, but we'll stick to this for this talk. We've collected the sample from this, this beautiful region of Switzerland. Um, this is the Ticinese region. It's the Italian speaking region of, of Switzerland. Um, and actually the Bedretto lab, if you look at this profile is actually the profile you see here. The Bedretto labs um, concealed two kilometers in. So if we go two kilometers in and add it here, um, we're under around 800 meters of overburden or rock. Um, and these are pictures from the website. If you're interested, just Google Bedretto lab. Um, the project I'm um, mainly working on right now in their sphere where we're, we're attempting to make a large earthquake and study um, rupture physics and nucleation physics in a very close environment in a natural tectonic setting. So essentially upscaling the laboratory to a 20 meter scale. Um, and if you're interested in, and you are coming to Switzerland and would like a tour, we have very nice outreach programs and we can, we can have you um, very easily go inside and see this facility for yourself. Um, the facility is, if we keep going down the tunnel that you just saw the picture, we get to the lab. This is where the sample was collected from. It's, it's called Rotondo granite. It's an equigranular granite. As you see here, there's a study on the mineralogical composition. There's also a preliminary study on, on the, um, the basic mechanical properties that I'm showing here. So we have a good understanding of this rock material and we're trying to perform experiments on the intact material in this case. So how does it operate again? And I'll just go through this quickly. Um, the triaxial cell is uh, a sample that you just saw. It's jacketed inside this uh, rubber sleeve. I cut the rubber sleeve just for view here, um, just to show you the sample. The rubber jacket um, can keep the oils that are um, pressurizing the, the sample through the jacket. Um, and then we can also add differential stress. These little uh, sensors here that you see, they're actually acoustic emission sensors. And in this test that I'll show you, we have 16 of these small um, conical tipped, <clears throat> excuse me, acoustic emission sensors that are perforated through the jacket, but sealed. Um, they touch the tip of the sample and they're able to isolate the, the, um, the waves that are generated from an acoustic emission. The newer technology, um, this is actually accepted to JGR, but there's two types of fiber optic cables that we push through the jacket, then seal, then they wrap the sample um, in the circumferential direction and the axial direction. The novelty of these, um, these nice fiber optic cables is uh, traditional laboratory rock mechanics experiments. And I keep showing you this differential stress versus strain plot here. If you look closely on this sample here, maybe I'll zoom in, you can see strain gauges that are applied. These are traditional methods. Um, but what you will not see is the complexity that we're starting to see when the sample fails. So you'll have two measurements on this sample, for example, you can, you can fit more. But what we get when we, we string our cable through our fiber optic cable, such as this green acrylate cable here, is a single line that you can map back to the strain localizing or the strain on the sample. Uh, and thus we start, we start to see more complex deformation patterns. This is the paper in JGR that I can point you towards. Um, we're using uh, Rayleigh, Rayleigh uh, backscattering technology um, using the Luna OVR4600. Um, this, this gives us a spatial resolution, a high spatial resolution of about three millimeters on the sample surface. So it really allows us to visualize the strain field in a much higher resolution. And you can think that if we had the strain gauges, only a couple of them put on this sample, we would never have seen this type of um, deformation pattern. So this is the kind of unique feature that I'm, I'm gonna talk about in a little more detail today. The, uh, the experiments uh, used a variety of sensors on top of the acoustic emission sensors, but the title of this talk was Unraveling Complex Deformation. And to do so, you, you need to cover a broad band of frequencies and understand your sensors. So in this case, the high frequencies up to 10 megahertz were actually covered with the acoustic emission sensors. Um, these are what I call the high frequency measurements. This is similar to what I was showing you before in the Grimsel Underground Research Lab. They had acoustic emission sensors. Then we also have other sensors here. I don't go into the details. Um, but you have these, um, these low frequency, primarily the fiber optic strain gauges. And if you just like to see right here, maybe you can see them perforated through the jacket um, and just coming out. Um, and yeah. So 
again, if I un sorry, if I unwrap this sample now along its periphery, we can see the direct um, application of the fiber optics in the axial direction, the circumferential direction, and where the AE sensors would touch on the surface of the sample are depicted with the circles here. Um, and just to show you a, a little more detail, um, oh, sorry. You can see right here, the cables, uh, one of the cables is a very thin cable. This is thinner than a, a, a strand of hair, so it's quite tedious to work with, but it allows us to get more information. So this is the type of uh, distributions that we have right now, and they're based on the um, the research that was given to the, the public here. Excuse me. So the experiment was um, on a dry intact sample of Rotundo. The actual methodology is given here. So first thing we do was we confine the sample to 10 MPA. So that's the blue line here. So the rock thinks it's under that overburden that I showed you in that nice picture of uh, the Bedretto from the outside. So it's under 800 meters of the rock. And then we moved this top piston downwards, which increased the differential stress up until um, it reached an anelastic regime. Once in that regime, we would pause holding, uh, pause loading for five minutes, allowing the rock to relax and increase. Um, this was to draw out the and slow down the nucleation of shear fracture, which is uh, which is something that we wanted to do with this lab experiment. So we're continuously adding energy to the system on these steps until one of the steps just prior to failure, we didn't need to add energy. It started to run away. And when it ran away, it had a huge stress drop of around 150 NPA, which you can see is this sudden drop in, in differential stress. Looking in more detail, um, the first takeaway uh, is that was, there was a complex strain uh, response detected. Um, this was the typical um, view that I showed you before, and it doesn't look like anything special. If I average the strain in the axial, we see this typical compression of the sample up until brittle failure. And if we look at the rings, we see circumferential and the black is the average lines here and the other colors are representing the rings that you see here. The volumetric strain is typically calculated in rock mechanics experiments. So you see the sample compacts and then uh, it and then dilates, essentially starts to dilate as micro cracks coalesce into a macro fracture and then it um, then the, the shear failure of the material occurs. This is nice. It's relatively typical. What's really novel here is if we unwrap, let's say, these circumferential measurements, and each one of these is a, is a measurement in time around the perimeter of the sample. As we load until failure, failure is these, um, these re the last measurement we had in the cable, um, we see this very heterogeneous distribution of strain, which if you think about we were using strain gauges, we would not see this. So this gives us a level of, um, of understanding that is uh, unprecedented for these types of experiments and it's something that we're looking to build on. So I'll come back to this, but we'll jump now, just remember this result here and we'll get back to it. I'm gonna tie this into the acoustic emissions. So what are we doing with the acoustic emissions? In brief, there's a workflow we follow. We just listen to those 16 sensors continuously at 10, 10 megahertz, which produces around 2.1 terabytes of data. Um, in this paper we submitted to JGR recently, uh, we see this kind of workflow and how we can go from passively listening to and also updating our velocity model with, uh, with um, active surveys. We can get uh, locations of, of acoustic emissions, relocations of acoustic emissions, and using this, we can actually um, evaluate the moment tensor solution for the acoustic emissions that has been done in the laboratory um, for quite some time. So we, we applied uh, standard seismological techniques um, and we can show here one of the um, raw waveforms and I'm plotting on each of these sensors that you see around the periphery of the sample, the voltage on the sensor, you can see that there's high frequency energy that the sensors pick up. Um, we can run algorithms to detect them or classify events. Then on this detected event, we can apply um, other picking algorithms to pick the uh, the onset of the P waves. Um, using the onset of the P waves, we can use um, velocity models that uh, complex velocity models that we are monitoring throughout the experiment to isolate the location. Here, I represent the location of this event here with this star um, inside the sample. The polarity 
um, and uh, and the amplitude of the of the first arrival can also be used um, to generate some understanding of the focal mechanism, um, as you see here represented on a on a Hudson plot. And this is also useful because we can generate an estimate of the of the seismic moment or moment magnitude from these estimates. So this is just a run through of what one of the um, earthquakes look like. And I'll show quickly a video here. Um, what we're looking at is the confining stress and the differential stress increasing. Um, we see very little seismicity in the sample, and this will be important going forward. And then what we start to see is distributed seismicity throughout the sample. Um, now we're into the loading steps where we just we gradually add a little bit of energy to the system. Um, and it's still diffuse until a relatively late period of time where we start to see this increase of seismicity here. And you'll see the structure start to form. Um, we have some statistics. This is around 6,230 uh, events that we could um, locate and determine the moment magnitude from. Um, and what I do is I slow it down just here because there's a lot of events coming in at a very short time. They start to cluster and then the major fracture happens. These were um, leading up to the major fracture. It saturated our system. And then you can see this shear fracture had formed um, so this was one of the ways that we look at the, the locations are important for understanding, but it's not novel. This is not like super novel yet. Um, the seismicity, um, some of the, the properties of the seismicity is they predominantly occur at a later stage. Um, localization um, occurs rapidly at the later stages. So we see thousand, almost 2000 seconds is very little seismicity. We start moving towards failure and then AEs start to localize and then there's this um, shear fracture that begins to develop um, with a lot of events happening, then the failure happened. And we see this typical moment tensor response um, that, that, are, that has been found in different types of um, lab experiments on crystalline rocks specifically. Um, we see this distribution between LVD plus to LVD minus for these types of um, events. Now we can understand the spatiotemporal distribution the moment tensor solutions and focal mechanisms, but we can go one step further and we'll take a review quickly of statistical seismology here. So if we look at the distribution of those moment magnitudes um, uh, in time, uh, or just at any point in time, if we look at a catalog, we can judge how many big earthquakes there are to small earthquakes, and the scaling of these two will be related with this B value here. So I put the B value on the map. This is a used in seismological terms for estimating hazard by uh, uh, Laura Gulia and Stefan Wiemer in this nature paper. And you see this, uh, this, this hazard assessment of traffic light system they are working towards. Um, but a low B value where it's a uh, shallower slope of this line means there's a larger proportion of big earthquakes to small. And then a high, high B value means there's a larger proportion of small earthquakes to big. And um, this is deemed more safe and this is deemed more um, dangerous, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So it's a way to infer hazard in these problems. Um, this has been observed in nature. Um, it's debated, but it has been rigorously uh, in, uh, found statistically that the B value drops before large events. Um, this is the L'Aquila earthquake, the M6.3, uh, 2009, and, and even uh, um, Tessa Torman and, and their co-authors found that the B value dropped um, near to the hypocenter, which is uh, this region in the Tohoku earthquake um, in 2011, where the purple represents a shallower value, value of B value, a shallower, um, sorry, a lower B value and, and more big earthquakes to small earthquakes. Um, they also have seen this, um, in, and this is just one example, in the vicinity uh, of, of injection, uh, of an injection well in Basel, they could also see this B value increase essentially the injection well, but was um, it had some spatiotemporal patterns that were interesting. Has this been observed in the lab? Yes, it has. So there's there's a numerous amount of laboratory studies, and I'll highlight um, three that if you're interested, you should read the Schultz study that I referred to be before Amitrano in 2003, and his co-authors have a nice study uh, in JGR. And what I'm showing you here is another study from Thomas Goebel that looked at the increase of differential stress and the B value from the from his same kinds of acoustic, similar types of acoustic emission sensor that would drop um, in general leading up to this stress drop. Um, what are the physics behind this? We're starting to paint a nicer picture. And this is what I'm showing here is a video on the right 
from the uh, X-ray dynamic XRCT. So if I just show this video, what you're seeing red is poros higher porosity and they're loading the sample. As this number decreases, the differential stress is increasing and you'll see this coalescing of damage, which is associated with the increase of porosity or the, the coalescing of smaller cracks to bigger cracks or the formation of small or of new smaller cracks, um, which provides longer force chains. And one of the hypotheses here, and you see the shear fracture that's developed, sorry. Um, one of the hypotheses here is that micro cracks coalesce, force chains will build up. Then when they do release stress, stress is over a larger length scale. Therefore, as your samples push to failure, um, the proportional amount of larger events increases because there's more contiguous damage in the sample. Um, and this refer this these these findings in many of these studies have been used as to say that the B value changes in nature um, can be used as in situ stress meters. And this is something that was very useful and, and may still be useful uh, moving forward. Um, we want to move uh, one step further with this as well. So what we're doing here is we're also evaluating the B value in the experiment that I just showed you. Um, we employ the beta positive method, which is a, a van der Elst's uh, methodology that he's highlighted here. Um, this is a, a method that should be used when your catalog is inherently incomplete, which are uh, in most laboratory data sets are inherently incomplete. Um, and what we do is we see a clear evidence. So this is the experiment I just showed you and the beta positives here. And when I zoom in um, closer to the big stress drop, or this is the macroscopic failure, we start to see that, yes, there is this drop leading up to the um, major stress drop. Um, and what you can notice here in the latter stages, when, this, when the beta uh, positive value starts to drop, the differential stress is relatively constant in this case. So there, this increase, and you saw these, these fluctuations before, is quite, um, there is a general decrease, but there is some fluctuations in there that we don't understand um, in, the, in the B values. So when we move forward with this, what we want to do and what, we, what we're trying to show right now is that the B value um, is anti-correlated to the strain rate prior to nucleation. So if we look at the strain on these axial with the, with the fiber optic sensing, we can see that there's this, sorry, the strain rate. Um, we can see that there is, when we zoom in just before failure here, we start to see this runaway pattern um, that was in this same time frame that we're looking at here as this decrease in B value. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're comparing the local strain rate to the B value, beta positive or uh, analogous to the B value decrease. Um, and we see that um, prior to or close to nucleation, the B value is, is re relatively insensitive to the differential stress and starts to decrease with the, what we're, what we're plotting here is the volumetric strain rate versus the beta positive. So at this last moments before failure, we saw this anti-correlation here that we're investigating in more detail right now. This is a, this is a unique finding um, in the sense that it has uh, maybe some larger implications. Um, measuring distributed strain is possible in these underground rock laboratories that I was talking about. And I'll show you an example of where strain or or uh, our strain rate can be measured and inferred in, in natural situations, um, but it's very difficult to measure or infer stress. Uh, and if we're looking to use these B value changes as a stress meter, um, it might be difficult to justify at larger scales in the lab. It can be justified, um, but it seems to also have some correlation with strain rate. Um, and there's, there is some evidence in nature, um, this paper in April, uh, sorry, this paper in 2018 at the Gorka earthquake, shows the strain rate um, in, in regions local to the M7.8 hypocenter were increasing and the B value was decreasing. So this is preliminary, but their hypothesis is that high strain rate is associated with a local added or a pathway for the energy or the strain energy stored in the rock mass. And, and this, is a, this is a nice result. So the strain rate actually is consistent with subcritical crack growth where energy flow dictates where progressive damage occurs um, within the rock mass, uh, such as the very seminal studies by um, Atkinson. Um, and even energy arguments um, and the flow of energy um, also have been linked to determine the onset of instability 
Um, this is from Griffith to Rice uh, and, and, the, and, and controls dynamic rupture propagation. So these might be some interesting findings to investigate, and we're looking into them right now um, to get more concrete understanding of strain rate and B value dependence that they're looking at here. Um, that's one of the one of the main findings uh, that we're trying to emphasize here. Another one is just to visualize. It's not an easy topic to to plot the the. You see the previous slide showed strain rate from this map view, but this is a three dimensional problem in our case, um, and we also have localized seismicity and deformation that's happening in three D. So what you're seeing here is we're going to look down at the top of the sample. Um, in map view where we have row spots and the strain and, and each of these top, middle and bottom will be presented as these black rose plots here. And the density of AEs will just subdivide the volume into voxels and will populate for each, each uh, segment the amount of AEs that occurred in that voxel because it should have, due to spatial constraints, some influence or it, it, might, it might be related to the, the observations we're seeing on in glo the global deformation using the fiber optics. So if you keep this in mind, if we start um, at the um, this part of the experiment, what we see is even before there's a lot of seismicity, so right now there's very little seismicity in this sector, um, there is very little seismicity leading up to this, but we see anelastic deformation occurring, meaning if we looked at the rose plot, it would be a, a perfect circle Essentially, if it was isotropic homogeneous deformation of the sample, um, we already see that without even um, localizing of seismicity, we start to see this development of these lobes, and the lobes could be considered um, potential strain concentrations that are developing from preferential movement. And what we have here is a schematic diagram of what we think is happening within the sample. So. If we look here, we, we feel that when we map these, and there's more research we're doing into mapping this damage zone better, but as we move up, there's still diffuse seismicity. There's no localization in seismicity, but the lobes are growing, um, meaning there's some kind of internal process that's not generating seismicity above our um, detection level, um, but it is occurring in, in a large scale and quite a significant degree of deformation is occurring. So these lobes are increasing without the generation of a, a lot of seismicity. The hypothesis is that the damage started in the middle of the sample at a weaker point, moved downwards, possibly inhibited by a strength barrier in the up dip direction. Um, and then once it reached the edge um, where the strain lobes are really localized on the surface measurements here, um, we started to produce a crack within the damaged region that now produced quite a significant amount, a significant amount of localized seismicity that would, uh, we see that the strain started to um, have large jumps in concentration between small time, small time frames here. So we're looking here between each time frame, T8, T7. So between this frame and this frame, we see 175% increase in strain um, concentration at, at this location here. So we see this potential crack moving back through. And then what we, what we, what we think happened is the seismicity started to back propagate up like you saw in the video and potentially the crack itself reached a certain size that was uh, the, the total stress and energy in the sample was not, um, was not able to be supported by the, the weakened material and the, the dynamic rupture ensued, which is what we saw here. When the dynamic rupture ensues in our experiments, unfortunately, it severs our um, fiber optic measurements and we no longer have the fiber optics. So we don't have fiber optics past this point, um, but we do have this detailed view of the deformation patterns leading up to failure um, that correlate to some story that we can also tell with the seismicity. Um, and this was, this was reinforced, we sent um, the, the the sample to get scanned at, uh, at McGill University um, using the XRTC scanner there. And we see that the hypothesis here correlated to the last measurement and strain on the surface. What we were seeing with seismicity and the strain lobes was also um, was consistent with our image. And then we saw this, this fracture that we believe that moved up and this off fault damage. We can actually show that this was due to dynamic, um, dynamic rupturing of the sample and wasn't um, didn't show up on our on our fiber optic measurements beforehand. 
So we see this complex deformation pattern that's mapped with the distributed strain sensing um, and the and the distribution of fiber optic sensor uh, of uh, sorry of acoustic emissions um, inside the sample. The final thing we wanted to do in this study, and I'll wrap it up after this, um, we wanted to look um, at how much of the deformation um, was silent and how much was seismic, um, because this is a big topic in the in the seismological community. Um, and especially in the hazard community, if we start injecting water, but we're only seeing a, par a portion of deformation, or we're not understanding the full physics from the seismicity that, that's being emitted, then we have trouble um, reconciling hazard and risk to the population. Um, and what we've done here is we look at time to failure, um, and we can take um, our moment tensor solutions um, and actually infer the volumetric change from each event, um, and then uh, correlate that from the from the material properties story. So we go through um, the math here from the moment tensor solution, the fault plane solution, and then figure out exactly what the volume change was. Um, and then we can look at the volumetric change measured on the fiber optic sensors up to failure. Um, and our sensors were severed, severed here um, and the acoustic emissions measure longer. But when we look at the, even in the worst case, we're looking at a um, very small percentage of the seismic um, emission, uh, seismic volume change here is, uh, uh, sorry, of the volume change here is seismic, where a majority of the, of the deformation appears to be aseismic. Um, and then this is uh, consistent with other laboratory studies and also what, um, what people are seeing in natural um, conditions. So we had around 0.004% of deformation was emitted seismically. So I'll, I'll summarize it um, and into these last few points here. Um, we implemented a dynamic and quasi-static measurement systems um, to study the fracturing in a granite sample. Uh, we did this because we're downscaling the exact technologies that we use uh, one scale higher in the underground rock labs. Um, and with these two technologies, we were able to firstly see more complex distribution of strain that was not visible before um, uh, and only inferred from XRCT measurements and, and very small samples. So we're able to constrain this to a larger degree and see these interesting growth patterns and, and strain heterogeneity as you see in this one figure. Um, so this was a, a, the first finding that I, I'd like for you to take away. The next is that there seems to be some relationship between the B value and strain rate um, that, that seems to be anti-correlated. And this is an interesting uh, proposition in terms of um, energy and energy balance um, dictating where damage and stability of fractures occur within rocks uh, in the earth. So this is a preliminary finding that we're investigating more. Um, more so, um, we found that the seismicity does follow in the latter stages um, the localization and the progressive localization of the fracture as it develops. Um, and this was confirmed with XRCT fiber optics and acoustic emissions. So that's a nice um, finding in terms of um, that the, the seismicity is represented in, in the latter stages as representative of a, of a region of rock that is deforming in a, in a fast rate and um, highly localized um, manner. So this is something that's uh, possibly um, something to test at the next scale up. And then finally, um, seismic deformation was very, very small and accounted for a very small percentage of the, of the total deformation around 0 0.004 in this experiment. Um, and this is something that we want to look uh, into more detail with. Um, so with, with that, and it's really late here, so I appreciate the opportunity, but I'll, I'll summarize. These are the summaries. I'll leave this up. 